Hello, I'm Robert Royal. I'm the editor-in-chief of The Catholic Thing, which is a daily column series, and these are The Catholic Thing podcasts, which we're also bringing to you under the auspices of the title The Vatican Thing. Um, we're into the second to the last week of the Synod on Synodality here in Rome, which is where I am right now, and we're hearing even that the uh, committee that is going to write the final document, which is a report on the Synod, has been elected and is busily already working on certain parts of that. Maybe we'll get to that by the end of this episode today. We're quite happy to have with us again Diane Montagna, who was in one of our earlier episodes, to talk about is the Holy Spirit the protagonist at this synod? And Diane has become one of the most prominent English-speaking uh, journalists in Rome covering the Vatican. And she, she has distinguished herself because she's asked these pointed questions, such as, if the Holy Spirit is the protagonist, how do we know whether it's the Holy Spirit or another spirit that's speaking? And I encourage you to go back and listen to that episode if you didn't see it. Diane, welcome. Yeah. It's good to be with you again today. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I thought that what we might do in this episode is talk a bit about women. Um, you cover a variety of, of uh, issues, obviously, the whole spectrum of things that are going on in the church. But in the last couple of days, there have been some recent developments that I thought were quite interesting. I mean, we, we always expected that there would be, for example, some demonstrations outside the Synod Hall itself by more radical you know, women's groups. Uh, just this past weekend, there was this Spirit Unbound conference, not here in Rome, but you know, calling for women's ordination and the sharing of power at all different levels. And of course, we expected that that was going to happen. But I want to read a passage. I've got a report here from um, Courtney uh, Mares, who is also uh, an American uh, English-speaking uh, reporter. And she just did a story at the end of last week that on Friday, um, a nun, and she wrote this in the Catholic News uh, Agency, which is a very reliable source of news for our, our viewers and listeners. She wrote about a mother, Maria um, Ignazia Angelini, who gave an exegesis of the New Testament for the Synod delegates. And this was a, a, a general congregation, like a, a public speech in the uh, in the uh, Synod Hall, in which she claimed that St. Paul, and I want to quote what Courtney wrote in her article, I'm quoting her, um, that St. Paul, this is in the Acts of the Apostles, inserted himself into a non-ritual female liturgy when he arrived in the city of Philippi, Macedonia, speaking to hundreds of Synod participants in the Paul VI Hall, Angelini described how Paul was welcomed by a liturgy outside the ritual, among women in the open air. She said, Angelini said, the apostle did not start as was his custom in the synagogue. He inserted himself into a non-ritual female liturgy, breaking into it with the word of the gospel. Now, I don't think you need to be a scripture scholar to know that that's a <laughs> usual reading of what went on, and many people have said, what is a non-ritual liturgy? I mean, but what, what is your reaction to that? Could you uh, tell us a bit about what you're hearing and what you're thinking yourself? I do think that it points to two things. One is, you know, if something like this can go through uh, the Synod Assembly, um, I think it points to a general lack of theological knowledge and formation within the Assembly and among the participants. And I also think, importantly, that perhaps it points to the fact that there are more people in this assembly who are for women's ordination, at least to the diaconate, than we might expect. You'll remember, and the viewers will, will perhaps remember, that in the Instrumentum Laboris, it's asked, um, how can we envisage women's inclusion in the in the women's in the diaconate? Now, that envisage, what does envisage mean? I mean, a lot of these people from, say, Switzerland or Germany, certainly can envisage uh, women being part of the diaconate, just as this sister, the mother abbess, was envisaging that St. Paul was inserting himself into a non-ritual female liturgy. But theologically, yes, but theologically, that doesn't mean that it's a serious idea whatsoever. Interestingly, right. I'll say it here for the first time, I was uh, speaking to someone last week, uh, I won't say where, so as to to protect their identity. But this was someone who was actually very much in favor of 
women's ordination, even to the priesthood. And they told me that within the Synod Assembly, this is someone who's very connected within the Synod Assembly, they said that this is not just uh, something coming from Northern Europe. I think we, the German bishops are in there, some of whom participated in the Synodal Way, like Bishop Betzing, Overbeck. They are certainly for women's ordination. Or we might think of Helena Jespin Spieler from Switzerland. She's a laywoman who was chosen to present the Instrumentum Laboris and is very much in favor of women's ordination. This source told me that, uh, surprisingly, there are three African bishops who are in favor of women's ordination to the diaconate. There's one Eastern Europe, just one Eastern European bishop who would be open to it. There are several Latin American and Asian bishops. And they did comment that in terms of the United States, um, Cardinal McElroy and especially Cardinal, Cardinal Wilton Gregory are open to the idea of admitting women to the diaconate. Right. Yeah, I think it's a surprise that, that uh, all those figures, and, and there, there seems to be so much um, enthusiasm for these more progressive views inside the room than I would have anticipated myself. Look, at the same time, as we know, um, actually, you brought this to my attention, there's been a, a statement by, I think, signed by almost 20, I think over 2,200 women of a kind of a more traditional orientation, at the same time looking for ways in which women can make their contribution to the church. Um, that statement came out recently and um, I think has received far less attention than the kinds of things we, we were just talking about. Could you tell uh, our viewers and listeners a bit about that statement as well? Yes. So this was a statement that was developed by, it's a women's movement. It's based in Denver, Colorado. They're called Restored Tradition. Um, most of the women do go to the traditional liturgy, though this statement, it's really important to say, the statement is very much a statement that is meant to unite women who go, whether it's to the new mass or to the old mass, but simply hold to and believe everything that the Catholic Church teaches. And I think because the role of women, there's been a lot within this Synod Assembly um, that is being put forth in the name of the role of women. We might think of changes in the structure of governance, which people don't really realize that. This perhaps, but this is a huge issue because there's already been a push in the Amazon Synod to separate governance from holy orders. You know, taken to its logical conclusions, that would um, undermine the divine constitution of the Catholic Church. So a lot is being put forward um, in the name of the role of women. And also, you know, normal Catholic women, uh, their voices often aren't aren't heard. And so these women wanted to make a, a short, brief, strong statement, respectful statement, particularly addressed to the bishops who will be participating in the Synod. I, I was struck that there were almost kind of a set of dubia in there where they raise <laughs> questions and you know, they ask people to, to answer them. So it's very well crafted and I think that we ought to pay some attention to to them, bring, bring attention to it. And we'll try to actually link to that document at the, the Catholic Thing website so people can look into it yes. themselves. I should mention also that um, today the, uh, the statement was put out in Italian, and I believe the intention is to have several other languages published uh, in these next days, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Polish, and Italian, so that you know this is something that can unite women and be open to women around the world. Yeah, I ought to say that we're recording on October 17, 2023. So um, if you're seeing this, probably we'll be on the air on the 18th. Um, you'll, you can look back and see if those uh, other languages came out the day before. Diane, as you know, they, they, these are meant to be a brief uh, podcast, so we don't tie up uh, our time too much or people's time too much. We all have a great deal to read and to listen to. So I'd just like to ask you, because you have... Um, uh, such wide interest about what's going on in the church before we wrap up here. What else would you uh, encourage people to keep an eye on in addition to the, the women's questions that we've discussed in this episode? What else uh, do you see coming down the line over these final two weeks of the Synod? Well, um, the Synod Assembly, I believe they're, they're set to enter into Module B3, which is one of the later modules, perhaps this Wednesday. Uh, as early as this Wednesday, and I think it's there that the, the issue of governance uh, comes in and changing the structures of the church in order to allow for the inclusion of women, for instance, in the governance of the church. As I said before, that could be 
um, an issue that people don't realize its gravity, but is a serious threat to uh, to what we know as the Catholic Church. Um, I, also, I also think it will be interesting to see what we hear about the final document. Um, there's a final synthesis report that's supposed to come out at the end of the Senate Assembly. We've been told thus far that the members will be voting on it. I asked Paolo Ruffini the other day at the press, one of the press briefings, two questions. I asked him in terms of content, what will the Synod members be voting on? Will they be mo be voting on proposals um, as in past synods to which you give a yay or a nay, or as it's been suggested in reports earlier on, um, a few weeks ago, that they might be voting on simply whether this synthesis report is an accurate reflection of the conversation had over these, these uh, past weeks. Now, of course, if the latter is the case, then that would automatically push this document through to the next Synod Assembly without giving a real possibility for any uh, differing opinions. Um, I also asked Paolo Ruffini, uh, in terms of the voting, um, if the Synod Secretariat will provide us with, let's say that there's a proposal that's being voted on. The question was, will we be given the breakdown of how many bishop members voted on that particular uh, proposal and how many non-bishop members promoted um, voted for that particular pros proposal. The issue being that this is being billed uh, still as a synod of bishops. If you had the bishops on a particular proposal um, uh, divide, say, 50-50 on the vote, uh, on a controversial vote, let's say, and you have you know, a certain percentage of the laity vote yes to something that's very controversial, that would push, thing, that would push the vote through if there's a two-thirds majority required. So um, a serious issue. And it's hard to see this as um, see the credibility or the authority of this assembly if that would be the case. And Paolo Ruffini said that he didn't say no directly, but his answer effectively was no, we would not be receiving that because all of the members share in the communion, the one communion of this one synodal assembly, and by their baptismal priesthood are all have the same authority. Yeah, and we're all walking <laughs> together. You know, on this governance issue, I've seen recently now, I, I mentioned this on a, 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 a EWTN people policy, but I'm actually even seeing proposals that the, the next pope should be elected democratically. So even while there, there are denials that this is a democratization of the church, we see that it's drifting in that direction, even taking the highest offices in, in the church. Well, and if I may say, I think that the fact, the very fact that we're having um, this synodal assembly, this synod of bishops, um, billed as a synod of bishops, but in fact, we've got laity having an equal vote, and not just laity, but laity who dissent from the Catholic faith having an equal vote to the former prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Already, by this, the very fact of this event, it shifts the Overton window. So, you know, if today it's the Synodal Assembly having a vote uh, with, you know, that's equal between bishops and laity, what's next? Yeah. A conclave, yeah. as you might suggest? Yeah. No, yeah, I, I really think that the, the, the dynamic is all in that direction, and we have to keep a very close eye on it. Diane, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks a lot, and I, I have no doubt that we'll have you back here before long as these uh, things start to develop. Thank you, uh, Diane Quintana. Um, please follow her everywhere you possibly can. Uh, Google her name and you'll be very happy to, to see the things that she's been producing about what's going on, not only in the Synod, but about, about the church in general. Um, and thank you all of you for watching and listening to this podcast, and we'll see you again next time.